attention to all the connections. Don't join all the dots. Do you need to mention? When a minister should not be a minister. When a preacher should not be a preacher. When a pastor should not be a pastor. When somebody in full-time ministry should not be in the ministry. When? Let's look, please, to the book of Titus, chapter 1. Titus, like Timothy, was one of Paul's sons in the Lord. Not only the influence that Paul had on their lives, but the influence that Paul had in grooming them for the ministry, not just discipling them as believers to follow Jesus, but as grooming them to be his successors as the next generation of leaders after the apostles. That was Timothy, that was Titus, and Paul gives very similar instruction to both of them. And he says this instruction is not just for you, but it's what I want you to teach in other churches concerning leadership. Leaders who should not be leaders. For this reason, in verse 5, I left you in Crete that you might set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Notice elders. Where in the New Testament model of leadership is there a one-man show? Where is there an autocratic pastor? Where was there ever anything like that? Even in mission teams, the Holy Spirit said, set out for me Barnabas and Saul, Acts 13. Jesus sent the apostles out in pairs, and there was always accountability. Paul and Barnabas reporting back to Antioch, the apostles in submission to each other at the council in Jerusalem. Where do you ever see a one-man show? The idea of Moses being the model for the church is not a New Testament motif. Moses was a unique character for Old Testament Israel, but you don't see that model of leadership anywhere in the New Testament. It's simply not taught. This doctrine of a one-man show where you have an autocratic pastor is known as monoepiscopacy. Monoepiscopacy. We have two basic words for pastor in the scripture. Poeon is one, but the more common one is episcopo. We get the word episcopalian. Epi, around, scopos, looking over the sheep. There are other terms like presbyter and so forth in different contexts. But you never find certain things that people refer to today. For instance, a priest, we're all priests. The word for priest in the Greek New Testament comes from the word heron, temple. You never see a separate priesthood apart from the priesthood of all believers in the New Testament. If you're in a church or denomination that has a priest, that's something that people invented. There's no such teaching. I once watched a Franciscan priest on the Catholic Channel uh, here in the United States, and he was telling people, he was basically lying. He kept reading from the New Testament scriptures, translating the word presbyter into priest. Well, there's a perfectly good word in Greek for priest and a perfectly good word in Hebrew, kohen. There's no such thing as a priest in the New Testament except for the priesthood of all believers with Jesus as our high priest. We're all priests. Completely unscriptural concept. They have no biblical basis for it. Neither is there any biblical basis for monoepiscopacy, a one-man show. Here's how it came about. The church has always been very good at doing something, correcting error with error. <laughs> In order to correct one error, they get another one. <laughs> correcting error with error. You don't correct error with error. You correct error with truth. But the church, one counsel after another has addressed error and made an effort to correct error with another error. Very often, those errors emanate from not going back to what the scripture originally states and teaches. There were a lot of false apostles and false teachers in the early church. We know this from the book of Acts and from what the apostles wrote, particularly Paul. 
also the Apostle John and his epistles, many false people. And they're publicly named. The apostles named people like Diotrephes. They named people like Alexander the coppersmith, like Hymenius. They named people um, like Philetus. They actually warned by name who these were. When Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus and people like this, he would name who these people were so the church would be warned about them. And God put it in his words so it would be publicly known. Now today people say we shouldn't name the name of people who are misleading the church. That's unloving, it's ungracious, it's unchristian. If somebody is actually misleading the people of God with serious error, with heresy, the apostles named people like that. And Paul instructed his own disciples to warn about them, to silence them, to stop them. But today, in the name of love, we allow wolves to devour the sheep. In the name of love, we allow wolves to devour the sheep. In the name of love, we have allowed Satan to discredit the church publicly with the televangelists and people like this. In the name of love. That's not the love of Jesus. It's not the love of Jesus. It's some kind of a emotionally charged religiosity based on ignorance and spiritual pride that they imagine to be love. Now, I'm not saying we go around and debate, dispute, fight over secondary doctrinal issues all the time. But if somebody is teaching something flatly heretical, directly apostate, misleading the church with lies, hurting people, the apostles warned about people like this. So did Jesus. He said Herod was a fox. The Gospels show you what Caiaphas was by name and what Ananias was by name. Directly, the Hebrew prophets named these people. Jeremiah named the false prophets like Hananiah. They named the wicked kings. They openly named them. But today, the lie is put out. Their favorite verse seems to be, touch not my anointed. That verse occurs three times in Chronicles, Samuels, and in Psalms. But in all three places, it makes reference to King David's encounter with King Saul at the cave of Ein Gedi. No, David would not touch Saul. Saul was God's anointed. I question if many of these conniver money preachers today are, were ever anointed of God, but I even question if some of them were ever saved. God knows. But Saul was God's anointed, and David wouldn't touch him. But it didn't stop David from telling the truth about Saul. And it didn't stop Samuel, under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, from writing the truth about Saul, that he was a backslider and a murderer who went into the occult. But today, you see the ignorant religious babbling. Touch not my anointed. That's the get out of jail free card for religious swindlers, for con artists. That's what people have been mindlessly brainwashed into thinking and believing. This is absolute foolishness. It's not scriptural. Touch not my anointed. Israel anointed judges, kings, high priests, and prophets. Every king of Israel and Judah was anointed. Yet, what does the scripture say about Rehoboam and Jeroboam and Jeroboam II? What does it say about Zedekiah? What does it say about these wicked kings? who misled the nation. It names them, doesn't it? The Hebrew prophets must have touched God's anointed. Yet you've got these, Herod was, a, Jesus said he was a sneak, a fox. Look at the way that Jesus talked about religious leaders who misled the people in Matthew 23. Yet they say, you're ungracious, you're unloving. If you don't let the wolf devour the sheep, <laughs> If you don't let the wolves come in and ravage the sheep, you're unloving, you're judgmental, you have a critical spirit. 
and they think they're being loving and spiritual and Christian and wise and Christ-like. They're just being carnal and ignorant. And they're demonically deceived themselves. So what does Paul go on to say? He's teaching the people he's grooming to be his heirs, and he's telling them, go appoint elders. No one man shall. In the early church, as these false prophets proliferated, the apostles would write against them. Jesus warned about those saying they were apostles who were not in the church of Ephesus and things like this. So the early Christians began trying to deal with this problem by getting their doctrine from churches that were planted by the apostles. They'd say Jerusalem. They'd say Corinth. They'd say Antioch. They'd say Rome. We know that these churches got their doctrine from the apostles. So therefore, we'll go to cities where the apostles planted the churches and the doctrine came from the apostles originally. This led somebody who was a sincere believer, but he was ignorant and deluded. His name was Ignatius of Antioch in the second century to invent this doctrine of monoepiscopacy. Now, some of his crazy ideas were like this. Jesus said, when they persecute you in this city, flee to the next. <laughs> We're not to seek a martyr's crown. If you get it, get it. <laughs> Accept it as God's will for you to get it if you get it. But we're not to be suicide bombers. Jesus said to flee persecution. That was his command. He himself evaded the people until it was his father's time for him to get arrested. He evaded them. Now, if God leads you into a situation, that's one thing. But it was not the norm. This guy, Ignatius, taught, don't be robbed of your martyr's crown. There were apparently cases from historical tradition that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would be on martyrs so powerfully that the lions would be afraid to attack them in amphitheaters and arenas as a testimony to the pagans. There was cases where this happened. So Ignatius said, if the lions don't attack me, I'm going to attack the lions. I will not be robbed of my martyr's crown. This is crazy. This is suicidal. Now, I don't say he wasn't a brother. I don't say he didn't mean well. But my people perish for a lack of knowledge. His doctrine was off. And that kind of false teaching gets people killed. It probably did get people killed. I had a friend in New York, good guy, dear friend, Jewish guy. His parents were unbelieving Jews. He got saved at the age of 11 listening to a radio broadcast as an 11-year-old Jewish kid in Brooklyn, got saved. His parents were atheistic, but they certainly didn't believe in Jesus. His parents took him to some psychiatrists who were Jewish, and they had the kid committed to a mental institution at the age of 11. He was locked up with crazy people, with mentally ill people from the age of 11 to 15. Finally, some people from a Pentecostal church who were visiting the asylum came and they found out what happened. And they got him out of there. They got some Christian psychiatrists and lawyers and they got him out of there. But imagine being locked up from, at, at formative age from 11 to 15, locked up in a mental institution for your faith because you were Jewish by your own family. This happened to my friend Bill. The Lord saved him and he was very clever. He was clever. He came into the church and he found ways to take the heat from the air conditioning system and <laughs> he'd make hot water for the church to save the church electrical money. He found ways to make old elevators work without having to replace them at the expense of the church by cannibalizing parts. He was, he was very clever technically. And he made substantial amounts of money as a commodity trader. He was a very clever guy. He was not a stupid person. He was a clever person both technically and financially. Yet, it was Pentecostals who got him out of that place. But these were hyper-Pentecostals. And they got him into the word faith thing, that you only go to a physician or a dentist if you're weak in faith. 
You simply have the elders anoint you with oil and you don't go to medical science. That's for unsaved people or for people who are weak in faith. You just claim the heal. He got this. Well, to make a longer story shorter, he developed trigonosis. He wouldn't get medical help until it was too late to save his life. These people who got him out of the mental institution were true believers who meant well. But their doctrine also killed them. <laughs> My people perish for lack of knowledge. There are sincere people who believe things that are detrimental to them and to the body of Christ, and it can even kill people. Well, Mono Episcopus, he came from such a person, the one-man show, the one-man pastor. The New Testament never, ever puts it all on one man. Now, there will be, there will be a primus inter paris, a first among equals. There will be a senior pastor. There's always going to be somebody at some point. On the day of Pentecost, Peter emerged. By Acts 15, it was James who emerged. Later on, it was Paul who emerged. There's always going to be a first among equals, but never a one-man show. That was never God's model, ecclesiologically for Christian leadership. As soon as you get into that situation, the devil only has to shoot for one target, to hurt a church, maybe even to bring it down. He's only got one target to shoot at. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. It doesn't work. Not only that, but it brings an unreasonable and an unscriptural amount of pressure on one person. An unreasonable amount of responsibility. People in leadership, people in pastoral ministry are going to be tempted and satanically attacked more than other people anyway. Strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. People in leadership are going to be Satan's bigger targets anyway. But if you're putting it all on one guy, there's only one target he's got to shoot at. It is just not scriptural. There are sincere people who believe these things. There are people who love the Lord who believe these things. There are churches who've grown despite these errors, but there are churches who have fallen because of these errors. That's to begin with. If you've got a pastor who's an autocrat, who's following some kind of an idea that it's a one-man show, or the pastor is it, you know, <laughs> and if you don't agree with the pastor, you're in some kind of rebellion, that will lead to heavy shepherding in some cases. That will lead to spiritual abuse, what Jesus called the deeds of the Nicolaitans. We don't know who, what they were, but we know what Nico, suppression of the laity, means. Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I've warned about this many times. Yet you've got seminaries and movements that tr condition people to follow this idea of the one-man show. The Roman Catholic Church is based on it. The Church of England is based on it. The Eastern Orthodox Church is based on it. But sadly, so are certain evangelical movements and denominations. It is not a scriptural model. They cannot show you one place where leadership in a church is a one-man show. They can't show you one place. Everywhere the apostles went in the book of Acts and they planted churches, they ordained elders. They didn't appoint a pastor. One of the pastors, one of the elders may be the pastor. He may be the first among equals. He may function the way Peter did in Acts 2 or the way James did in Acts 15, functionally. But remember, New Testament leadership is always functional 
and relational. It is never hierarchical. It is always functional and relational. It is never hierarchical. It's just another brother who has that job. Look how Peter puts it in his <laughs> epistle. Let's look at Peter. Chapter 5 of 1 Peter. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. <laughs> I exhort the leaders among you as your fellow leader. Notice there was no primacy claimed by Peter. He didn't claim to be the Pope. He didn't issue a papal encyclical. He just said he was a fellow leader. He didn't set himself above anybody. He didn't claim to have a key. The others didn't have none of that. Remember, as we teach on our recording of Psalm 23, Jesus is the pastor of every evangelical fellowship. It doesn't matter if it's a house church with 20 people or a mega church with 20,000. Jesus is the senior pastor. What we call the senior pastor is the assistant pastor. He is our shepherd. Adonai Roi, Yehovah Roi. He's the pastor. The pastor you see is only the assistant, but he's only the first among equals among the assistants. That is the biblical norm. Now, this can be very dangerous. Remember, the Greek term antichrist, antichristos, primarily means in place of Christ. <laughs> This is how the Roman papacy developed, where the Pope claimed to be the vicar of Christ and be infallible over a period of centuries. The New Testament says the vicar of Christ, the one who acts vicariously in place of Jesus, is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Pope puts himself in place of Christ, claiming to be the vicar. This is an antichrist doctrine. If you were to take the Pope's title in Latin, Vicarius Christus, and put it into Greek, it's antichristus. Every pope says, I am Antichrist. Now, the Roman papacy may be an extreme example of what happens when monoepiscopacy is taken to its natural conclusions. But it's always a disaster. You'd be hard-pressed to find a single church that ever fully recovers when a pastor goes down morally. You're going to see what happened the Fort Lauderdale Calvary Chapel, now that Bob Coy was found to be an immoral person, may he repent. I'm not attacking him, but it happens in the media. That church is never going to be what it used to be. Had it not been a one-man show, it might have bounced back. Had there been a Barnabas with Paul or a Paul with the Barnabas, had there been a Fred or a Gary with Bob, you've got a much better chance of recovery. You've got a much better chance of rebounding. But once you have a one-man show, it's a setup. It's a setup. Oh, you're being judgmental. You're being critical. No, I'm trying to be scriptural. I don't want to see churches collapse because the devil got to a pastor. His flesh is old nature. May the Lord keep us all away from that. It can happen to them, it can happen to any of us, but when you got a one-man show, you got one target to shoot at, and the devil knows it. That's the one he's going to aim for. Strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. Just like when he went after Jesus, the Lord can get rid of all of them. Well, let's continue looking. If you're in a church with a one-man show, with the senior pastor, is autocratic. At best, you have an unscriptural model of ecclesiastical polity. At worst, you have a formula for heavy shepherding. Verse 6. 
tells Titus, now set these things in order. This is not just for Titus. It's for Titus to go to these churches and teach these things. If any man be above reproach. Well, Paul is big on this. He says something very similar in 1 Timothy chapter 3. An overseer must be above reproach in verse 2. This is a big issue. We must have a good reputation with those outside the church. The world may lie against us, and if the world lies against a leader, a pastor, a preacher, the Lord will defend him. They may lie, but if they actually have something to use against us that's valid, now Satan's the accuser of the brethren. They can accuse, they can amplify some minor thing out of proportion, but if there's something serious, if somebody does something serious, he's out. If the world has something that they can bring reproach, they're out. He runs off with the church secretary, gets divorced from his wife, gets married, and then he's back in the ministry. You've got that homosexual who left his wife from the National Association of Evangelicals. He's back in ministry. Jim Baker, back in ministry. Now look, I'm not out to condemn those guys, but what they did was wrong. What they did was absolutely wrong. But now the world knows it. If we can cover the sin of a brother or a sister, we should do so. But once the world knows it, they're not qualified anymore. They're not above reproach. They will accept the consequences of their actions. If somebody falls into serious immorality or impropriety as a leader, if they repent, they may be restored to fellowship. Christianity is based on forgiveness. They can absolutely be restored to fellowship. But once it is publicly known, they're not above reproach. Yes, they can be restored to fellowship. But no, they cannot be restored to leadership. If they insist on getting back in the ministry, they never really repented. Because if they repented, they would accept the consequences of their actions. Jim Baker just took up with a false prophet, Rick Joyner. Todd Bentley leaves his wife and kids, takes off with a woman. Now he's restored by Rick Joyner, and the woman he took off with, she's co-prophesying with him, while his wife and children are abandoned. And Joyner and these guys and Bill Johnson they had no problem with it. They prophesied over him. This is a disgrace. It is a moral outrage. It is a public reproach to the name of Christ. Such people have no right to be in ministry. None. No, I don't care what somebody did before they were saved. One of my closest friends is probably the most infamous serial killer murderer in the history of the United States. He pastors a church of people who are doing life in prison where he himself is a prisoner and he will never get out. You know the son of Sam, David Berkowitz? One of my closest friends. He pastors a prison fellowship of hardcore criminals and murderers who are never getting out. There were some liberal lawyers who said he was criminally insane at the time, therefore he should have been found not guilty by reason of insanity, and they actually wanted to try to get him out. He wrote a letter to the governor saying, the people I murdered were capitally executed. Their families have a life sentence. It would be a gross injustice for me to ever leave this prison. 
On top of that, he believes God wants him there. That's his ministry. That's his congregation. That's his flock. What somebody does before they're saved doesn't matter. He can be a pastor. But unlike so many so-called pastors who are not above reproach, he accepts the consequences of his actions. And he did terrible things. He did terrible things. I mean, he's one of my closest friends. I know what he did. He told me the whole thing. He told me things that have never been published. And it was, it was unbelievable what he did under demonic possession. But now he's a new creation. And he's a pastor. He forwarded one of my books. I love the guy. That's different. But somebody who leaves his wife and kids and tries to get back in the ministry once it becomes publicly known? They protest and say, well, what about David? You don't believe in grace. God restored David. Don't you believe in grace? False comparison. That was the old covenant, not the new. That was the old covenant, not the new. We go by the New Testament. We read the old in light of the new. Reading the old in light of the new, David was from the tribe of Judah, not from the tribe of Levi. David was never in the ministry. He was never a Levite. He was never a Cohen. He had a political office, a regal office. He was never in the ministry. They're making a false comparison. He was never a high priest. He was never any of that. They're making a false comparison. But again, in their ignorance, this is what they've been told, so this is what they believe. They must be beyond reproach. These people like Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker, Bob Coy, Orwell Roberts' son, people divorced and remarried with no scriptural grounds, they can never go back into the ministry of leadership again. If they really repented, they would accept the consequences and ramifications of their deeds. Otherwise, they've not repented. Oh, you're unloving, you're judgmental, you're critical, you're unforgiving. It's what the Word of God says. I didn't write it. The world can always point at swagger. They can always just mention Jim Baker to an unsaved person. They'll laugh at you. They know he was a swindler and a heretic. Even the world knows it, that he was personally immoral. Now, as Christians, if he repented, we can forgive him. But we shouldn't put him on the back of a pulpit. Shouldn't put him on television. He has no biblical right to be there. If God forbid I should ever go down morally, do me a favor. Never come listen to me speak even if I could deceive myself into thinking I should be able to. I should never be able to if I ever did that. May God keep me from that. Now, we can all have flaws and make mistakes, and, you know, somebody like this, you know, he was going 35 miles an hour instead of 30, and he got a speed camera, got him. I don't care about that. But to leave your wife, <laughs> to run off with a woman, to embezzle money, Tons of money, like Young Yi Chao did in Korea. These people have no right to be in the ministry. None. And those who support their being in the ministry are in rebellion against God. If you're in a church with a pastor who, as a Christian, got divorced from another Christian with no biblical grounds, I don't mean something before they were saved. I don't mean that they got saved and an unbelieving husband or an unbelieving wife left them for another. I mean two saved Christians getting divorced and remarried. That person is in an adulterous marriage. That's an adulterer in that pulpit. I don't care how gifted they are. They're not known by their gifts. They're known by their fruits. They have no right to be there. Oh, he repented. Then he won't be in the ministry. You accept the ramifications of what you 
did. Well, let's look. Verse 7, above reproach as God steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered. That's one thing I struggle with terribly. I can get pretty angry sometimes. Fortunately, the ministry God has called me to was not pastoral. I couldn't handle the sheep. Not addicted to wine. Not pugnacious. Be careful of people who always like to argue for the sake of arguing. Not to uphold truth or righteousness just because they like disputes. <laughs> who are argumentative for the sake of being argumentative. They think it's their lot to go around straightening everybody else out. People like that are as wrong on one extreme as those who will do what the book of Proverbs calls wink the eye are on the other. Winking the eye, letting something immoral or heretical go by. Neither extreme is balanced or scriptural. Not fond of sordid gain. People who are in the ministry for a livelihood. If somebody is not willing to make tents, they shouldn't be in the ministry. Now, if the ministry grows, if the church grows to the point they require a person or people full time, the sheep need feeding, looking after, visitation, missions, whatever. Somebody has to travel to the mission fields and things like this. If a ministry by God's grace grows, if a church by God's grace grows, and you need people full time, perfectly acceptable. However, if somebody is not willing to make tents, they should not be in the ministry. It's very easy to be a professional Christian. It's very easy to be spiritual when you get paid for it. And then tell other people who have to go to the office every day or to the factory every day, who have to interact with the world every day, how to be spiritual. For years, for years, in Israel, I filled prescriptions six days a week co-led a congregation and did evangelism in addition. For years, I made tents. Now, I don't take a salary from Moriel. I don't take royalties from my tapes or books or anything like that. I can take an honorarium or love offering if somebody gives it, but I can't ask for it. I have a secular business. I work, as I always have. Tzvi has a secular job. Dave Royal has a secular, I mean, Dave Lister has a secular job. Marco has a secular job. Most people in Moriel are tent makers. Now, we do have people taking care of orphans and AIDS babies in the third world and in the Philippines and in Africa. We do have full-time missionaries taking care of sick kids and stuff like that who are full-time. We have missionaries who are full-time. <laughs> But most of us make tents. It would not be wrong if God blessed Marco's church to the point they needed a full-time pastor for him to go full-time. That would not be a problem in principle, providing the person is willing to make tents. If you're going in the ministry for a career or a job, just go get a career or a job. Don't turn the ministry into it. More than that, there's two other things to be very cautious of. People who turn it into an enterprise. A lot of these people, particularly the money preachers, are people who could not make that kind of money in a secular job. They're not clever enough. Most of them could not make that kind of money as an investment banker or as an oral surgeon or a high-powered lawyer, they wouldn't have the intelligence or the intellectual ability to do so. So they prostitute the word of God to live salubrious lifestyles. They wouldn't have that money if they were not in the ministry. I've said this before, and it shocks people, but I will tell you the truth. I once led a pimp to the Lord in New York. 
he would not have had that kind of money or that pink Cadillac or those designer clothes had he not been a pimp. He was a predator. He knew how to find these girls from abusive families who ran away from home. He'd be the father figure they never had. He'd be nice to them. He'd buy them presents and he'd get them hooked on drugs. Then they'd be working for him. They'd burn out in a few years and he'd go get some more. He was a pimp. He never would have had that kind of money had he not been a pimp. He didn't have the education. He probably doesn't even have the ability to get that to get an education. Even if, even if he had had the opportunity. He's just a pimp. He's a predator. Well, it's the same thing. These money preachers, they are nothing but religious pimps. And the churches who follow them are their stupid whores. These people are nothing but predators. They're religious pimps. And the churches they pastor are their whores. It's that simple. It's a shame. It's a disgrace. But it's true. It's sordid gain. They're prostituting the word of God. Who do predators go for? The vulnerable. I remember Mara Sorella with his Holy Ghost miracle course to take away debt. Who was buying it? Poor people. He was selling them for $40, 25 English pounds, when he came over from California to Great Britain. Who was buying that stuff? Mainly poor people. Mainly poor people. He knew how to prey on minorities, single mothers, people like that, give them a false hope by the Holy Ghost miracle. What is this? Sordid gain. They're fond of sordid gain. They couldn't make that kind of money in a secular business or industry or profession. They're not clever enough. Now, on the other extreme, I know people who've given up lucrative careers and professions to go into the ministry. I've known missionaries who left very comfortable suburban lifestyles in the developed world to go live on the edge of subhuman poverty in the third world. I've known the opposite. I've known people who took tremendous pay cuts and gave up good lives to go to the third world. I've seen the opposite. Which of the two is more Christ-like? <laughs> they really do give hope to the poor. They give the gospel. They give themselves. Sordid gain. Third thing, watch out for nepotism. When ministry goes from father to son, when it becomes the family business. I cannot necessarily say it is automatically wrong, but usually something stinks. They don't have a family business to pass on to the next generation, so they pass on the church as if it is a matter of family propriety. No, the family are not the proprietors. The father cannot will the church to his son. The Lord must appoint the leadership. And leadership is plural. <laughs> when you see your church run as a family enterprise, look out. I've known two mission organizations that were destroyed by the fact that the missionaries in the field were related to the people on the board. They were run as family enterprises. Now, it's not wrong to have your children go into the ministry. <laughs> but let them go into a different ministry. <laughs> my daughter is a member of the Christian Lawyers Fellowship. She's a lawyer. A lot of lawyers are Jewish, as my daughter is. She witnesses in the Lawyers Fellowship to other lawyers, many of whom are Jewish, as she is. And she fights Christian rights cases and things like that, pro bono work. She does stuff like that. It's guess what the Christian Lawyers Fellowship does. That's her ministry. <laughs> Let her have, may God bless her ministry. <laughs> I'm glad she's serving the Lord in her profession. We need Christian lawyers to fight for the rights of Christians and, and things like that. <laughs> you know, I'm glad she has that. Let her have that. Let her do that. I'm good with that. But I wouldn't want Moriel to be a family enterprise. 
sordid gain. Well, let's look further. Hospitable. You know, pastors have to be sociable kind of people. <laughs> the reason they're told they're worthy of double honor, honorarium has to do with money, is because of the expense of being a pastor. <laughs> They've got to buy extra food and extra things and, you know. Loving what is good, sensible. Be careful. Among my fellow charismatics and Pentecostals, too often, common sense and spirituality become mutually exclusive in a wrong way of thinking theologically. <laughs> common sense and spirituality are not mutually exclusive. They're mutually complementary. When you see these lunatics running around, I just feel the Lord would say. We had a meeting once in England, in Nottingham, and we had some local organizers, and we helped them organize the first meeting. They wanted me to come, and I did, and we had a few hundred people. And we got a mail list. This was before internet. So we'll do a mail shot of people who are going to come again if they, if they want to come the next time I was in Nottingham. This was some years ago, before internet was widely available. It was in its infancy then. And it was people there. I came back the next time. And it was like, I don't know, 30, 40 people, something like that. I said, what happened? What happened? Usually there's, not that I'm chasing numbers, but usually there's more people. When did you do the mail shot? Oh, we didn't. We just felt the Lord would bring them. We just prayed and we thought the Lord was going to. Be careful of that kind of religious idiocy. People and its idiocy. People who are too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. It is not spiritual. It is pseudo spiritual. It's idiotic. Be careful of people who are that ethereal. I just believe the Lord's going to... Common sense and spirituality are not mutually exclusive. Well, let's look. What else does Paul tell Titus to tell these other churches? Just, they've got to be fair. They've got to be fair. Got a phone call today from a dear friend, Jewish brother, who split up with his wife. He was in leadership in the Messianic movement. He'd been my friend for years. I still love him like a brother. His wife is a difficult woman. I'm not blaming him for the breakup of the relationship. But unless there is unrepentant immorality, there is no biblical grounds for divorce. The last resort of last resorts for saved Christians is separation with the door open to the eventual possibility and hope of reconciliation, but not divorce. He tries to immigrate to Israel. The Israeli government, well, the religious Jews told the Israeli government he's a believer. They found out. He's denied immigration, denied citizen. Now he's back in the States. I love the guy. I had to say to him, my brother, I told you this divorce was wrong. To think you could go to Israel and go back into the ministry while divorced without biblical ground, even if you don't remarry. It's out of God's order. Maybe if you'd been in God's order, you would have got the citizenship. This happened, but even if the devil had a hand in it, the Lord allowed it to happen because your life is out. Now, I'd like to say, because he's my friend, I know she, that she, she would drive me nuts too. I don't blame you. <laughs> well, 
That is true. I don't blame him. That woman is impossible. I don't blame him. <laughs> I mean, it takes two to tango. I'm not saying the whole thing is her fault, but that woman, I don't blame the guy. Nobody I know, <laughs> well, except for a few others who are like her, <laughs> blame him for what happened. The primary blame was not his. I'm convinced. But the way he handled it was not scriptural. Because he's my friend, I have to be just. If it's wrong for somebody else, it's wrong for you. And if it's wrong for you, it will be wrong for me. Unequal weights and measures, unjust balances are an abomination to the Lord. Be careful of people who will make exceptions. and applying biblical standards. Devout, that's obvious, self-controlled. Twice we're told the fruit of the Spirit is ikrete, being self-controlled. You see these lunatic phenomena that are a combination of the carnal and the demonic, counterfeit revivals like you've seen in Pensacola and Toronto and Lakeland, Florida. I've seen people with the usual nonsense they do. I couldn't control it. It must be God. Well, by virtue of the fact you couldn't control it proves prima facie it can't possibly be God. When the Spirit of the Lord comes on me, I have to prophesy. I can't quench the Spirit. I have to prophesy. The Spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. <laughs> If somebody's not in control of themselves, God's not in control of them. Now, I don't believe in quenching the spirit. But I've actually heard some of these people teach, <laughs> like Mike Bickle's people. This is what they teach. This is what they teach pastors. I'd rather let people manifest in the flesh. This is Mike Bickle's teaching. For fear of the Holy Spirit being suppressed, I would rather let things that are carnal or worse take place for fear of suppressing them. No, no, no. Scripturally, you suppress what's carnal so that which is genuinely spiritual can blossom. You hear their warped reasoning? Well, look what else it says. Holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, the didaskin, that he may be able both to exhort to sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Proactive and reactive. If a leader cannot expound doctrine proactively, if he cannot rightly divide the word of God, he should not be a pastor. And he should certainly not be a paid one. Paul says it is those who work hard at preaching and teaching the word of God. Study to show yourself approved. If they don't study, God does not approve of them. If God does not approve of them being in leadership, how dare we? Why should you go to work every day to support your own family and pay your own taxes? and pay somebody else who doesn't have to work as hard as you do. It's not that easy being in the ministry. <laughs> I assure you, if somebody's honest, it's not that easy. It's a tough life. It really is, in many respects. I speak here as a tent maker. I've had secular jobs in the ministry. I tell you, it's not easy. God does not approve of them. You see these, the way I always put it, I've said this before, maybe on YouTube. They get up week after week, it's the same old nonsense. I'm just going to share what's on my heart. What do they really mean? I don't have anything in my brain. <laughs> but then it says something else. <laughs> to refute those who contradict sound doctrine. A lie of the devil was expressed by 
the daughter of a man I respected considerably. She expressed the following lie of the devil, believing it to be true herself. I don't say she lied. She's just ignorant and she shouldn't have been allowed to speak. Her husband failed to control her or correct her. She should be told to keep her mouth closed. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She has no business being in Christian media. None. This is what she said. She said, we shouldn't really seek to correct those who are false teachers. Look at Apollos. The believers just got next to him and explained more clearly things to him. Apollos was not a false teacher for reasons of geography. He did not have a full illumination of the gospel, but he was faithful to what he knew. He didn't teach anything false. What he taught was true. He just didn't fully understand all of it. But what he taught was all true. He didn't teach anything false. To call Apollos a false teacher <laughs> when he was not? And to say that's the way we should deal with false teachers? This is blithering ignorance. A person like that should keep their mouth shut and have nothing to say publicly. They shouldn't even be allowed to teach other women because she doesn't know what she's talking about. And her husband is a shame and a disgrace for not controlling her. But they don't care. Now, these are not my standards. These are God's. If a pastor will not correct fundamentally false doctrine, I don't mean the things godly people can disagree about, but something fundamental? If they are going to let the word faith thing or another gospel, oh, it's okay to be Roman Catholic. There are brothers and sisters. Talk to an ex-Catholic. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin? Or do you atone in purgatory for your own? Which gospel do you believe? How is sin forgiven? How do we get salvation? By sacraments and purgatory or by second birth? It's a different gospel. Oh, there are true believers in the Catholic Church. Yeah, they need to come out of it, as many have. Come out of her, my people. They need to come out of false religions like Rome and liberal Protestants, which are worse. It's not just Rome. Liberal Protestantism is worse than Rome, usually. Our Jesus said, if anybody says I've come back physically, don't believe it. I'm coming back physically the way I left. The Mass says he comes back transubstantiated under the appearances of bread and wine as the blessed sacrament. They pray to it in an act of open idolatry and eat it in an act of open religious cannibalism, thinking that's Christianity. This is cannibalism and idolatry. Oh, we have to love Catholics. You're unloving. You're judgmental. <laughs> Find me an ex-Catholic who isn't happy that somebody explained the truth to them. <laughs> ask an ex-Catholic. Don't ask a religious babbler. Will your leader teach the truth? Does your pastor put a lid on error. Paul elaborates on these things further when he writes Timothy. Keeping his children under control with all dignity in verse 4 of 1 Timothy 3. As long as your children live at home, as long as they are living at home, under your roof, until they go away to the military or to university or whatever, as long as they are under your roof, their conduct cannot be reprobate. And if it is, you need to get out of the ministry and take care of your family. That's your first ministry. Then 
You can go look at the ministry. But your first ministry is always your own household, as long as your children are living under your roof. He goes on. Not a new convert. I have seen people going to so-called Bible colleges who've been saved a few years. They don't know anything. They don't even know basic doctrine. In Great Britain, Stephen and I went to what Americans would call a seminary that had a high academic standard. Academic theology, a scholarly knowledge of the scriptures in Greek and Hebrew, can be of practical value as long as you know basic doctrine. <laughs> as long as you already are well grounded in basic doctrine, you can benefit from academic theology. But to send somebody to a seminary and teach them academic theology and think that's going to equip them for the ministry, <laughs> by the time any of that academic knowledge does them any good, they will have forgotten it all already. Mature students, people who've already been in the ministry, lay ministers who then go get a theological education, people like that often profit from seminary educations if it's a good seminary. But to send a new believer into an academic environment or to put a new believer into leadership? They've been saved two years, three years for... It's a formula for disaster. Paul warns they can be swollen with spiritual pride. It's not a good thing. It is not a good thing. Now understand something. We're not talking about biological age. Paul told Timothy, let no one look down on your youth. God told Jeremiah, don't say I'm only a youth. It's not how long since you've been born. It's how long since you've been born again. You understand? There are people 25 years old that have their head on straight that should be in the ministry. And there are people 55 who shouldn't. <laughs> it goes by second birth, not by birth. Okay. Not a new believer. Not somebody who's not well grounded in basic doctrine. Not somebody who does not study the show themselves approved not somebody with messed up little kids living under their roof, not somebody who's divorced and remarried, not somebody who doesn't know how to correct error and wouldn't have the backbone to do so anyway in some cases, not a hireling, not somebody like that. I've pointed out many times we have three kinds of leaders according to Jesus in John chapter 10. I, we cover this on some of our other teaching tapes. We have wolves in sheep's clothing, predators who are in the ministry who try to look like Christians. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. Most pastors, however, are not wolves in sheep's clothing. There are some, but most of them are not that. Although there are some, for sure. Then we have good shepherds. Good shepherds are like Jesus. They lay the life down for their sheep. You, you want to see good shepherds? Come with me to Vietnam. I'll show you guys that have been arrested, tortured, thrown in prison, beat up but they wouldn't leave their sheep. Good shepherds. Some of these guys are incredible. Incredible. I asked them once, how many of you have been in prison for your faith? Almost every one of them. <laughs> I uh, occasionally have, well, more than occasionally, have spoken at a so-called, they call it a Bible college in Indonesia most populous Muslim country in the world. Young people, young people, 
19, 20, 21, 22. Many of them saved out of Islam. They're going to leave that Bible college and they're going to the hinterland of Indonesia, to Java, to Borneo, to Sumatra, wherever, to plant churches. And they know they're going to face persecution and many of them know they're going to face martyrdom. 3,000 churches are burned to the ground every year in Indonesia. Nobody says a word. They're going to face martyrdom. They know when they leave that place, they're going to be persecuted, and they know some of them are going to die. And they're only young people. It's quite a thing, isn't it? That's quite a thing. If you were to read the history of Christian England, there were once people like that in England called the Lollards in the time of John Wycliffe. There were the same thing happened in England in the time of John Wycliffe. We got to understand that the victories are won by people who are not afraid to be persecuted and even martyred. Now, I see people like that. The one thing they're not out for is sordid gain. <laughs> the one thing not motivating them is sordid gain. I don't say they want a martyr's crown, but they know they're going to get one. But they do it anyway because they love Jesus. He saved them out of Islam. And he told them to go back. And then we'll do it. As I always say, look, I, can, I go there and I teach these young people, young future pastors, I teach them about the scriptures. <laughs> but they teach me what the scripture is about. Same as in Vietnam. I can teach them about the word of God. They teach me what the Word of God is about. <laughs> I've, I've pointed this out many times. I've seen true Christians in California. I've seen true Christians in Great Britain, in Canada, and Australia. I've seen true Christians in many countries. But to see true, true Christianity, the only places I've seen true Christianity, like the Book of Acts, is places where the church is persecuted. I'm just being honest. The only places I've seen where it's, I, there's places in Africa and in Asia and places I've been to, I can show you, you know, people today run around, where's the book of Acts today? Where's the signs and wonders? <laughs> they all want the signs and wonders. They don't want the persecution. <laughs> you really want to see the book of Acts? Come on, I'll show you. I'll show you. But I'm not sure you'd want to stay there. I'm just telling you the truth. So then we have the third category of pastor. Most are not good shepherds, neither are most wolves in sheep's clothing. Most are what Jesus called hirelings. The ministry has become their job. It's their job career. They're chasing numbers and money. They're chasing formulas based on church growth that comes from secular marketing. They're following the purpose-driven lie copied from Peter Drucker, an unsaved marketing guru who died as far as anybody knows without Christ. He was Jewish. That's where Rick Warren got it. They're following Schuler and Hybels, but they're not following the teachings of Jesus. They're not following the teachings of the apostles. Now Fuller Seminary, what does it have? Call them up and ask them if they have a gay and lesbian Christian students fellowship at Fuller Seminary. <laughs> this is what you're up against these days. This is what's happening. Oh, you're unloving, you're judgmental, you're critical. No, I'm scriptural. I'm only asking the question, are you a leader who should be a leader? Or are you a leader who should get out of leadership? Is your pastor somebody who should be a pastor? Or is your pastor somebody who 
who should be removed from the ministry. Did God put him in that position? Or did he seat himself on the seat of Moses? If he does not meet the biblical standards that we read about in Timothy and Titus, a pastor, a leader, have not been put in that position by the Holy Spirit. They have sat themselves on the seat of Moses. God bless. <laughs>